Good evening, friends, fiends, and night owl supremes. Welcome to A Bit Late, where we are continuing our ghostly dive into Henry James's The Turn of the Screw with Part 3, which is chapters 6, 7, and 8. This tale is a long tale, so do settle in, get comfy, get cozy, gather those animal familiars around you if you can for this ghostly tale. And of course, grab some sustenance, snacks, beverages, coffee, tea, candy, Candy? Hey, whatever you gotta do. But, last we read, we left it on a cliffhanger. A very big cliffhanger. And I will briefly summarize everything up to this point. Last time, the governess had fallen so much under the spell of her charges, she cannot imagine anyone wanting to expel the angelic Miles from school. She sees a mysterious and handsome man on one of the crenellated towers during her evening stroll about the gardens, and gets a shock when she sees him again peering through the dining room window. So far, she has told no one about this. Bravely, she rushes to confront this peeping intruder, only to see that he has vanished. She finally confides in Mrs. Gross, who pieces things together, telling her that the handsome man is none other than the valet Peter Quint, who is dead. Yes. And that cliffhanger is just where we left off and where we'll be resuming the tale tonight. So join me for The Turn of the Screw, Part 3, Chapter 6. It took, of course, more than that particular passage to place us together in the presence of what we now had to live with as we could. My dreadful liability to impressions of the order so vividly exemplified, and my companion's knowledge henceforth, a knowledge half consternation and half compassion of that liability. There had been this evening, after the revelation left me, for an hour so prostrate, there had been, for either of us, no attendance on any service but a little service of tears and vows, of prayers and promises, a climax to the series of mutual challenges and pledges that had straightaway ensued on our retreating together to the schoolroom and shutting ourselves up there to have everything out. That's right, they were supposed to go to church, but instead barricaded themselves in the schoolroom to fear this out, as you do. The result of our having everything out was simply to reduce our situation to the last rigor of its elements. She herself had seen nothing, not the shadow of a shadow, and nobody in the house but the governess was in the governess's plight. Yet she accepted without directly impunging my sanity the truth as I gave it to her, and ended by showing me, on this ground, an awestricken tenderness, an expression of the sense of my more than questionable privilege, of which the very breath has remained with me as that of the sweetest of human charities. What was settled between us, accordingly, that night was that we thought we might bear things together. Aww. And I was not even sure that, in spite of her exemption, it was she who had been the best of the burden. I knew at this hour, I think, as well as I knew later, that I was capable of meeting to shelter my pupils. But it took me some time to be wholly sure of what my honest ally was prepared for to keep terms with so compromising a contract. I was odd enough company, quite as odd as the company I received. But as I trace over what we went through, I see how much common ground we must have found in that one idea that, by good fortune, could steady us. It was the idea, the second movement, that led me straight out, as I may say, of the inner chamber of my dread. I could take the air in the court, at least, for there Mrs. Gross could join me. Perfectly, I can recall now the particular way strength came to me before we separated for the night. Mm. We had gone over and over every feature of what I had seen. He was looking for someone else, you say? Someone who is not you? He was looking for little Miles. A portentous clearness now possessed me. That's whom he was looking for. But how do you know? I know, I know, I know. My exultation grew. And you know, my dear. She didn't deny this, but I required, I felt, not even so much telling as that. She resumed in a moment, at any rate. What if he should see him? Little Miles, that's what he wants. She looked immensely scared again. The child? Heaven forbid, the man, he wants to appear to them. That he might was an awful conception, and yet, somehow, I could keep it at bay, which, moreover, as we lingered there, was what I succeeded in practically proving. 
I had an absolute certainty that I should see again what I had already seen, but something within me said that by offering myself bravely as the sole subject of such experience, by accepting, by inviting, by surmounting it all, I should serve as an expiratory victim and guard the tranquility of my companions. The children in especial, I should thus fence about and absolutely save. I recall one of the last things I said to Mrs. Gross that night. It does strike me that my pupils have never mentioned, she looked at me hard as I musingly pulled up, his having been here in the time they were with him. The time they were with him and his name, his presence, his history in any way. Oh, the little lady doesn't remember. She never heard or knew. The circumstances of his death, I thought with some intensity. Perhaps not, but Miles would remember. Miles would know. Ah, uh, don't try them, broke from Mrs. Gross. I returned the look she had given me. Don't be afraid, I continued to think. It is rather odd. That he has never spoken of him? Never, by the least illusion. And you tell me they were great friends? Oh, it wasn't him, Mrs. Gross with emphasis declared. It was Quint's own fancy. To play with him, I mean, to spoil him. She paused a moment and then she added, Quint was much too free. Oh, I don't like that. This gave me, straight from my vision of his face, such a face, a sudden sickness of disgust. Same. Too free with my boy? Too free with everyone? I forbore, for the moment, to analyze this description further than by the reflection that a part of it applied to several of the members of the household, of the half-dozen maids and men who were still of our small colony. But there was everything for our apprehension in the lucky fact that no discomfortable legend, no perturbation of scullions, and even within anyone's memory attached to the kind of old place. It had neither bad name nor ill fame, and Mrs. Gross most apparently only desired to cling to me and to quake in silence. I even put her, the very last thing of all, to the test. It was given at midnight she had had her hand on the schoolroom door to take leave. I have it from you, then, for it's of great importance, that he was definitely and admittedly bad. Oh, not admittedly. I knew it, but the master didn't. And you never told him. Well, he didn't like tail-bearing. He hated complaints. He was terribly short with anything of that kind, and if people were all right to him, he wouldn't be bothered with more. This squared well enough with my impression of him. He was not a trouble-loving gentleman, nor so very particular perhaps about some of the company he kept. All the same, I pressed my interlocutress. I promise you I would have told. She felt my discrimination. I dare say I was wrong, but really, I was afraid. Afraid of what? Of the things that man could do. Quint was so clever, he was so deep. I took this in still more than probably I showed. You weren't afraid of anything else, not his effect? His effect? She repeated with a face of anguish and waiting while I faltered. On innocent little precious lives, they were in your charge. No, they were not in mine, she roundly and distressfully returned. The master believed in him and placed him here because he was supposed not to be well in the country air so good for him. So he had everything to say. Yes, she let me have it even about them. Them? That creature? I had to smother a kind of howl. And you could bear it. No, I couldn't, and I can't now. And the poor woman burst into tears. A rigid control from the next day was, as I have said, to follow them. Yet how often and how passionately for a week we came back together on the subject. Coming back passionately... Much as we had discussed it that Sunday night, I was in the immediate later hours in especial, for it may be imagined whether I slept, still haunted with the shadow of something she had not told me. I myself had kept back nothing, but there was a word Mrs. Gross had kept back. I was sure, moreover, by morning that this was not from a failure of frankness, but because on every side there were fears. It seemed to me indeed, in retrospect, that by the time the morrow's sun was high, I had restlessly read into the fact before us almost all the meaning they were to receive from the subsequent and more cruel occurrences. 
What they gave me above all was just the sinister figure of a living man. The dead one would keep a while. And the months he had continuously passed at Bly, which added up, made a formidable stretch. The limit of this evil time had arrived only when, on the dawn of a winter's morning, Peter Quint was found by a laborer going early to work, stone dead on the road from the village. A catastrophe explained, superficially at least, by a visible wound to his head. Such a wound as might have been produced, and as, on final evidence, had been, by a fatal slip in the dark and after leaving the public house on a steepish icy slope, a wrong patch altogether at the bottom of which he lay, slipped coming out of the public house. Mm. The icy slope, the turn mistaken at night and in liquor accounted for much, practically, in the end and after the inquest and boundless chatter for everything. But there had been matters in his life, strange passages and perils, secret disorders, vices more than suspected, that would have accounted for a good deal more. I scarce know how to put my story into words that shall be a credible picture of my state of mind. But I was in these days literally able to find a joy in the extraordinary flight of heroism the occasion demanded of me. I now saw that I had been asked for a service admirable and difficult. And there would be a greatness in letting it be seen, oh, in the right quarter, that I could succeed where many another girl might have failed. I mean, this challenge of heroism is supernatural, though many people failed. It was an immense help to me, I confess I rather applaud myself as I look back, that I saw my service so strongly and so simply. I was there to protect and defend the little creatures in the world, the most bereaved and the most lovable, the appeal of whose helplessness had suddenly become only too explicit, a deep, constant ache of one's own committed hearts. We were cut off, really, together. We were united in our danger. They had nothing but me, and I, well, I had them. It was, in short, a magnificent chance. This chance presented itself to me in an image richly material. I was a screen. I was to stand before them. The more I saw, the less they would. I began to watch them in a stifled suspense, a disguised excitement that might well, had it continued too long, have turned to something like madness. What saved me, as I now see, was that it turned to something else altogether. It didn't last a suspense, it was superseded by horrible proofs. Proofs, I say yes, from the moment I really took hold. This moment dated from an afternoon hour that I had happened to spend in the grounds with the younger of my pupils alone. We had left Miles indoors on the red cushion of a deep window seat. He had wished to finish a book. Oh no, they left him on a window seat? When you know who appeared in a window? Oh no. And I had been glad to encourage a purpose so laudable in a young man whose only defect was an occasional excess of restless. His sister, on the contrary, had been alert to come out and I strolled with her half an hour, seeking the shade, for the sun was still high and the day exceptionally warm. I was aware afresh with her as we went of how, like her brother, she contrived, it was the charming thing in both children, to let me alone without appearing to drop me and to accompany me without appearing to surround. They were never importunate and yet never listless. My attention to them all really went to seeing them amuse themselves immensely without me. This was a spectacle they seemed actively to prepare, and that engaged me as an active admirer. I walked in a world of their invention, they had no occasion whatever to draw upon mine, so that my time was taken only with being, for them, some remarkable person or thing that the game of the moment required, and that was merely, thanks to my superior, my exalted stamp, a happy and highly distinguished sinecure. I forgot what I was on the present occasion. I only remember that I was something very important and very quiet and that Flora was playing very hard. We were on the edge of a lake and, as we had begun geography, the lake was the Sea of Azov. Suddenly in these circumstances I became aware that, on the other side of the Sea of Azov, we had an interested spectator. Oh no. The way this knowledge gathered in me was the strangest thing in the world. The strangest, that is, except the very much stranger in which it quickly merged itself. I had sat down with a piece of work, for I was something or other that could sit, on the old stone bench which overlooked the pond. 
and in this position I began to take with certitude, and yet without direct vision, the presence at a distance of a third person. The old trees, the thick shrubbery, made a great and pleasant shade, but it was all suffused with the brightness of the hot, still hour. There was no ambiguity in anything, none whatever at least, in the conviction I, from one moment to another, found myself forming as to what I should see straight before me and across the lake as a consequence of raising my eyes. They were attached at this juncture to the stitching in which I was engaged, and I can feel once more the spasm of my efforts not to move them till I should so have steadied myself as to be able to make up my mind what to do. There was an alien object in view, a figure whose right of presence I instantly, passionately questioned. I recollect counting overly perfectly the possibilities, reminding myself that nothing was more natural, for instance, than the appearance of one of the men about the place, or even of a messenger, a postman, or a tradesman's boy from the village. That reminder had as little effect on my practical certitude as I was conscious, still even without looking, of its having upon the character and attitude of our visitor. Nothing was more natural than that these things should be the other things that they absolutely were not. Of the positive identity of the apparition, I would assure myself as soon as the small clock of my courage should have ticked out the right seconds. Meanwhile, with an effort that was already sharp enough, I transferred my eyes straight to little Flora, who, at the moment, was about ten yards away. My heart had stood still for an instant with the wonder and terror of the question whether she too would see and I held my breath while I waited for a cry from her, what from some innocent sign either interest or alarm would tell me. I waited, but nothing came. Then, in the first place, and there is something more dire in this, I feel, than anything I have to relate, I was determined by a sense that, within a minute, all sound from her had previously dropped, and, in the second, by the circumstance that, also within the minute she had in her play, turned her back to the water. This was her attitude when I at last looked at her, looked with a confirmed conviction that we were still, together, under direct personal notice. She had picked up a small, flat piece of wood, which happened to have a little hole in it that evidently suggested to her the idea of sticking in another fragment that might figure as a mast and make the thing a boat. The second morsel, as I watched her, she was very markedly and intently attempting to fasten in its place. My apprehension of what she was doing sustained me so that after some seconds I felt I was ready for more. Then again I shifted my eyes. I faced what I had to face. But what did she have to face, I wonder? The Turn of the Screw, Chapter 7 I got hold of Mrs. Gross as soon after this as I could, and I can give no intelligible account of how I fought out the interval. Yet I still hear myself cry as I fairly threw myself into her arms. They know. It's too monstrous. They know. They know. And what on earth? I felt her incredulity as she held me. Why, all that we know, and the heavens knows what else besides. Then, as she released me, I made it out to her, made it out perhaps only now with full coherency even to myself. Two hours ago, in the garden, I could scarce articulate, Flora saw. Mrs. Gross took it as she might have taken a blow in the stomach. She has told you, she panted. Not a word, and that's the horror. She kept it to herself. The child of eight, that child. Unutterable still for me was the stupefaction of it. Mrs. Gross, of course, could only gape the wider. Then how do you know? I was there. I saw it with my eyes. Saw she was perfectly aware. Do you mean of him? No, of her. I was conscious as I spoke that I looked prodigious things, for I got the slow reflection of them in my companion's face. Another person this time, but a figure of quite as unmistakable horror and evil. A woman in black pale and dreadful, with such an air also, and such a face, on the other side of the lake. I was there with the child, quiet for the hour, and in the midst of it she came. Came how? From where? From where they come from. She just appeared there and stood, but not so near. And without coming nearer? Oh, for the effect and the feeling, she might have been as close as you. My friend, with an odd impulse, fell back a step. Hmm... 
Was she someone you've never seen? Yes, but someone the child has. Someone you have. Then, to show how I had thought it all out, my predecessor, the one who died. Miss Jessel? Miss Jessel, you don't believe me, I pressed. She turned right and left in her distress. How can you be sure? This drew from me, in the state of my nerves, a flash of impatience. Then ask Flora. She's sure. But I no sooner had spoken it that I caught myself up. No, for God's sake, don't. She'll say it isn't. She'll lie. Mrs. Gross was not too bewildered instinctively to protest. Ah, how can you? Because I'm clear. Flora doesn't want me to know. It's only then to spare you. No, no, there are depths, depths. The more I go over it, the more I see in it, and the more I see in it, the more I fear. I don't know what else I don't see, what I don't fear. Mrs. Gross tried to keep up with me. You mean you're afraid of seeing her again? Oh no, that's nothing now, then I explained. It's of not seeing her. But my companion only looked wan. I don't understand you. Why, it's that the child may keep it up, and that the child assuredly will, without my knowing it. At the image of this possibility, Mrs. Gross for a moment collapsed, yet presently to pull herself together again, as if from the positive force of the sense of what, should we yield an inch, they would be ready to give way to. Dear, dear, we must keep our heads. After all, if she doesn't mind, she even tried a grim joke. Perhaps she likes it. Like such things, a scrap of an infant? Isn't it just proof of her blessed innocence, my friend bravely inquired? She brought me, for the instant, almost round. Oh, we must clutch at that, we must cling to it. If it isn't proof of what you say, it's proof of... Of God knows, for the woman's a horror of horrors. Mrs. Gross at this fixed her eyes a minute on the ground, then at last raising them. Tell me how you know, she said. Then you admit it's what she was, I cried. Tell me how you know, my friend simply repeated. No, by seeing her, by the way she looked. At you, do you mean, so wickedly? Dear me, no, I could have borne that. She never gave me a glance. She fixed only on the child. Mrs. Gross tried to see it. Fixed her? Ah, with such awful eyes. She stared at mine as if they might have resembled them. Do you mean of dislike? God help us know of something much worse. Worse than dislike? This left her indeed at a loss. With a determination indescribable. With a kind of fury of intention. I made her turn pale. Intention? To get hold of her. Mrs. Gross, her eyes just lingering on mine, gave a shudder and walked to the window. And while she stood there looking out, I completed my statement. That's what Flora knows. After a little, she turned round. The person was in black, you say? In mourning, rather poor, almost shabby, but yes, with extraordinary beauty. I now recognized to what I had at last, stroke by stroke, brought the victim of my confidence, for she quite visibly weighed this. Oh, handsome, very, very, I insisted, wonderfully handsome, but infamous. She slowly came back to me. Miss Jessel was infamous. She once more took my hand in both her own, holding it as tight as if to fortify me against the increase of alarm I might draw from this disclosure. They were both infamous, she finally said. So, for a little, we faced it once more together, and I found absolutely a degree of help in seeing now so straight. I appreciate, I said, the great decency of your not having hitherto spoken, but the time has certainly come to give me the whole thing. And I agree, why all this piecemeal story disclosure? Have out with it, we're dealing with this together, man. She appeared to assent to this, but still only in silence, seeing which I went on. I must have it now, of what did she die? Come, there was something between them. There was everything. In spite of the difference, Oh, of their rank, their condition, she brought it out woefully. She was a lady. I turned it over. I again saw. Yes, she was a lady. And he so dreadfully below, said Mrs. Gross. I felt that I doubtless needn't press too hard in such company on the place of a servant in the scale. 
but there was nothing to prevent an acceptance of my companion's own measure of my predecessor's abasement. There was a way to deal with that, and I dealt, the more readily of my full vision, on the evidence of our employer's late, clever-looking own man, impudent, assured, spoiled, depraved. The fellow was a hound. Mrs. Gross considered as if it were perhaps a little a case for a sense of shades. I've never seen one like him. He did what he wished. With her? With all of them. Oh no. It was as if now in my friend's own eyes Miss Jessel had appeared again. I seemed at any rate, for an instant, to see their evocation of her as distinctly as I had seen her by the pond, and I brought out with the decision. It must have been also what she wished. Mrs. Gross's face signified that it had been indeed, but she said at the same time, Poor woman, she paid for it. Then do you know what she died of? I asked. No, I know nothing I wanted not to know. I was glad enough that I didn't, and I thanked heaven she was well out of this. Yet you had, then, your idea. Of her real reason for leaving? Oh, yes, as to that. She couldn't have stayed. Fancy it here, for a governess. And afterward I imagined, and I still imagine, and what I imagine is dreadful. Not so dreadful as what I do, I replied, on which I must have shown her, as I was indeed but too conscious, a front of miserable defeat. It brought out again all her compassion for me, and at the renewed touch of her kindness my power to resist broke down. I burst as I had the other time made her burst into tears. She took me to her motherly breast and my lamentation overflowed. I don't do it, I sobbed in despair. I don't save or shield them. It's far worse than I dreamed. They're lost. The Turn of the Screw, Chapter 8 What I had said to Mrs. Gross was true enough. There were in the matter I had put before her depths and possibilities that I lacked resolution to sound, so that when we met once more in the wonder of it, we were of a common mind about the duty of resistance to extravagant fancies. We were to keep our heads if we should keep nothing else. Difficult indeed as that might be in the face of what, in our prodigious experience, was least to be questioned. Late that night, while the house slept, we had another talk in my room. Ooh. When she went all the way with me as to its being beyond doubt that I had seen exactly what I had seen. To hold her perfectly in a pinch of that, I found I had only to ask her how, if I had, made it up. I came to be able to give of each of the persons appearing to me, a picture disclosing to the last detail their special marks, a portrait on the exhibition of which she had instantly recognized and named them. She wished, of course, small blame to her, to sink the whole subject, and I was quick to assure her that my own interest in it had now violently taken the form of a search for the way to escape from it. I encountered her on the ground of a probability that with reoccurrence, for reoccurrence we took for granted, I should get used to my danger, distinctly professing that my personal exposure had suddenly become the least of my discomforts. It was my new suspicion that was intolerable, and yet even to this complication of the later hours of the day had brought a little ease. On leaving her after my first outbreak, I had of course returned to my pupils, associating the right remedy for my dismay with that sense of their charm which I had already found to be the thing I could positively cultivate and which had never failed me yet. I had simply, in other words, plunged afresh into Flora's special society and there become aware, it was almost a luxury, that she could put her little conscious hand straight upon the spot that ached. Oh, she's a healer by nature, so sweet. She had looked at me in sweet speculation and then had accused me to my face of having cried. I had supposed I had brushed away the ugly signs, but I could literally, for the time, at all events, rejoice under this fathomless charity that they had not entirely disappeared. To gaze into the depths of blue of the child's eyes and to pronounce their loveliness a trick of premature cunning was to be guilty of a cynicism in a preference to which I naturally preferred to abjure my judgment and, so far as might be, my agitation. I couldn't abjure for merely wanting to, but I could repeat to Mrs. Gross, as I did there, over and over in the small hours, that with their voices in the air, their pressure on one's heart, and their fragrant faces against one's cheek, Everything fell to the ground but their incapability and their beauty. 
It was a pity that, somehow, to settle this once and for all, I had equally to re-enumerate the signs of subtlety that, in the afternoon, by the lake, had made a miracle of my show of self-possession. It was a pity to be obliged to reinvestigate the certitude of the moment itself and repeat how it had come to me as a revelation that the inconceivable communion I then surprised was a matter, for either party, of habit. It was a pity that I should have to quaver out again the reasons for my not having, in my delusion, so much as questioned that the little girl saw our visitant even as I actually saw Mrs. Gross herself, and that she wanted, by just so much as she did thus see, to make me suppose she didn't, and at the same time without showing anything, arrive at a guess as to whether I myself did. It was a pity that I needed once more to describe the portentous little activity by which she sought to divert my attention. The perceptible increase of movement, the greater intensity of play, the singing, the gabbling of nonsense, and the invitation to romp. Oh, poor Flora has been trying to save her and protect her, even as she tries to protect little Flora. Yet, if I had not indulged to prove there was nothing in it in this review, I should have missed the two or three dim elements of comfort that still remain to me. I should not, for instance, have been able to asseverate to my friend that I was certain, which was so to the good, that I at least had not betrayed myself. I should not have been prompted by stress of need, by desperation of mind, I scarce know what to call it, to invoke such further aid to intelligence as might spring from pushing my colleague fairly to the wall. She had told me, bit by bit, under pressure, a great deal, but a small shifty spot on the wrong side of it all still sometimes brushed my brow like the wing of a bat, and I remember how, on this occasion, for the sleeping house and the concentration alike of our danger and our watch seemed to help, I felt the importance of giving the last jerk to the curtain. I don't believe anything so horrible, I recollect saying. No, let's put it definitely, my dear, that I don't. But if I did, you know, there's a thing I should require now. Just without sparing you the least bit, oh, not a scrap, come, to get out of you. What was it you had in mind when, in our distress, before Miles came back over the ladder from his school, you said, under my insistence, that you didn't pretend for him that he had not literally ever been bad? He had not literally ever in these weeks that I myself have lived with him and so closely watched him. He has been an imperturbable little prodigy of delightful, lovable goodness. Therefore, you might perfectly have made the claim for him if you had not, as it happened, seen an exception to take. What was your exception and to what passage in your personal observation of him did you refer? Well, that's quite a question and quite a way of dancing around it and getting there eventually. Wow. It was a dreadfully austere inquiry. Really? It seemed... Anyway, the levity was not our notes, and, at any rate, before the Great Dawn admonished us to separate, I got my answer. What my friend had had in mind proved to be immensely to the purpose. It was neither more nor less the circumstance that, for a period of several months, Quint and the boy had been perturbably together. It was, in fact, the very appropriate truth that she had ventured to criticize the propriety, to hint at the incongruity of so close an alliance, and even to go so far on the subject as a frank overture to Miss Jessel. Miss Jessel had, with the most strange manner, requested her to mind her business, and the good woman had, on this, directly approached little Miles. What she had said to him, since I pressed, was that she liked to see the young gentleman not forget their station. I pressed again, of course, at this. You reminded him that Quint was only a base menial? As you might say, and it was his answer for one thing that was bad. And for another thing, I waited. He repeated your words to Quint's. No, not that. It's just what he wouldn't. She could still impress upon me. I was sure at any rate, she added, that he didn't. But he denied certain occasions. What occasions? When they had been about together quite as if Quint were his tutor, and a very grand one, and Miss Jessel only there for the little lady. When he had gone off with the fellow, I mean, and spent hours with him. He then prevaricated about it. He said he hadn't. Her assent was clear enough to cause me to add in a moment. I see. He lied. Oh, Mrs. Gross mumbled. This was a suggestion that it didn't matter, which indeed she backed up by a further remark. 
You see, after all, Miss Jessel didn't mind. She didn't forbid him. I considered. Did he put that to you as a justification? At this she dropped again. No, he never spoke of it. Never mentioned her in connection with Quint? She saw visibly flushing where I was coming out. Well, he didn't show anything. He denied, she repeated. He denied. Lord, how I pressed her now, so that you could see he knew what was between the two wretches. I didn't know, I didn't know, the poor woman groaned. You do know, you dear thing, I replied. Only you haven't my dreadful boldness of mind, and you kept back out of timidity and modesty and delicacy, even the impression that, in the past, when you had, without my aid, to flounder about in silence, most of all made you miserable. But I shall get it out of you yet. There was something in the boy that suggested to you, I continued, that he covered and concealed their relation. Oh, he couldn't prevent. You're learning the truth? I dare say. But heavens, I fell with vehemence of thinking. What it shows that they must, to that extent, have succeeded in making of him. Ah, uh, nothing that's not nice now, Mrs. Gross lugubriously pleaded. I don't wonder you looked odd, I persisted, when I mentioned to you the letter from his school. I doubt if I looked as odd as you, she retorted with homely force. And if he was so bad then as that comes to, how is he such an angel now? Yes, indeed. And if he was a fiend at school, how, how, how? Well, I said in my torment, you must put it to me again, but I shall not be able to tell you for some days, only put it to me again. I cried in a way that made my friends stare. There are directions in which I must not for the present let myself go. Meanwhile, I turned to her first example, the one which she had just previously referred, of the boy's happy capacity for the occasional slip. If Quint, on your remonstrance at the time you speak of, was a base menial, one of the things Miles said to you, I find myself guessing, was that you were another. And again, her admission was so adequate that I continued. And you forgave him for that? Wouldn't you? Oh, yes, and we exchanged there in the stillness a sound of oddest amusement, then I went on. At all events, while he was with the man, Miss Flora was with the woman. It suited them all. It suited me, too. Whew, thank goodness, right? I felt only too well, by which I mean that it suited exactly the particularly deadly view I was in the very act of forbidding myself to entertain. But I so far succeeded in checking the expression of this view that I will throw, just here, no further light on it than may be offered by the mention of my final observation to Mrs. Gross. His having lied and been impudent are, I confess, less engaging specimens than I had hoped to have from you of the outbreak in him of the little natural man. Still, I mused, they must do, for they make me feel more than ever that I must watch. It made me blush in the next minute to see in my friend's face how much more unreservedly she had forgiven him than her antidote struck me as presenting to my own tenderness an occasion for doing. This came out when, at the schoolroom door, she quitted me. Surely you don't accuse him of carrying on an intercourse that he conceals from me? Ah, remember that until further evidence. I now accuse nobody. Then, before shutting her out to go by another passage to her own place, I must just wait. I wound up. And with that, that's the end of part three, chapters six, seven, and eight. We had a lot of revelations, and we had the appearance of Miss Jessel across the lake or C, if you're in the game of make-believe. But, wow, not a lot happened, but we had a lot of revelations about how much the children are involved with these appearing people. And we finally have more information from Mrs. Gross, who, I don't know why she concealed all this information. The story probably would be a lot shorter if she had not withheld it from the beginning, but here we are. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed the telling of this ghost story, part three. And I will see you soon with the next part in another video. But for now, off to sleep and dream what you will, or stay a while and enjoy another tale. Whichever you choose, I'll speak to you again. And until then, stay spooky, my friends. Good night.